evening. Welcome to our worship service here tonight. A special warm welcome to our guests and visitors who are here with us today. We're so glad that you could come and join us for this Good Friday. Uh, the service this evening is, is broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part of the service, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper, uh, the, the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed. He instituted that sacrament by which he gives to us his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. The second half of the service, we're going to be focusing on the death of our Savior. Um, and to do that, we're going to be going through the seven words or the seven phrases that Jesus said while he was crucified on the cross. And it's because of that sacrifice that he made on Good Friday that the sacrament we get to celebrate time and time again really means something. Uh, so tonight, even though our, our service is a little bit more somber, uh, it, it, there is joy because ultimately we see sins being forgiven through the death of our Savior. And, and even though it was our sins that drove Jesus to the cross, we want to know that Jesus did that willingly for us because he loves us just that much. Uh, at the conclusion of the service, you can note on the back of page 13. Uh, at the end of the service, you're invited to leave in silence. If you'd like to leave an offering, offering baskets are on the tables in the back. And we'd invite you to join us for worship on Easter Sunday. So please do that. Please plan on that Easter Sunday. With that then, we begin our service on page two with the invocation. We worship, friends, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Friends in Christ, followers of Jesus, during these days of Lent, our hearts have grieved. We've been confronted with the reality that it was our sins that brought Jesus into this world to live the life we couldn't and to die a death that should have been ours. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. All too often, each month, each day, I fail to recognize my sinfulness. I fail to recognize the rot of guilt within my heart. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Our unfaithfulness cannot negate Christ's faithfulness to us. In eternity he had you and me in his heart, and he never wavered from his journey to Calvary. He knew what was ahead, and yet he still drank the cup of suffering his father placed before him. Jesus died for you and for me. Thanks be to God, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We pray. God most holy, look with mercy on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over into the hands of the wicked, and to suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends in Christ, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen.
This time I invite the communicant members at peace and those who have spoken with me before the service to come join us. If you're visiting tonight and you're interested in taking the Lord's Supper with us in the future, please speak with me after the service. I'd love to tell you more. You may come forward then at the direction of our ushers.
He is by this time a pitiful, almost gruesome caricature of a man. His eyes blackened and blue from the relentless blows of the soldiers. His face swollen, uh, his brow dripping with sweat and blood. Early on Friday morning, he's led out to Calvary, and within an hour, within hours, the innocent sin bearer has been nailed to beams, hanging there between earth and heaven. He looks up at the sky. He looks down below. He sees the blood-stained hands of soldiers who have been gambling over his clothes. He hears the cries of the crowd. They're jeering. Pharisees, the teachers of the law, who finally got the man who, who always got the best of them. He hears their taunts. He hears his own brothers and sisters, fellow children of Israel, jeering and mocking him. What, do he, what does he say? Does he call upon thunder and lightning uh, on those soldiers who are mocking him? Does he call curses down upon heaven to those who are insulting him? Does he promise revenge? Does he, he promise them that they'll rue the day? What does he say hanging there between earth and heaven? Words of mercy. Maybe that's what we've come to expect from Jesus because we know him so well. But mercy, 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 and more mercy. The first word, Luke 23. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This is God's word. We join in singing verses 1 through 4 of O Dearest Jesus.
When they came to Golgotha that gloomy Friday morning, there were three men to be crucified, Jesus and two criminals. One was guilty of nothing. The other two were guilty of crimes that warranted the worst possible punishment that the state could come up with. With mingled emotions, they must have watched each other as in turn they submitted to the whole ordeal of crucifixion. I would venture to say that two of them were crucified by the sheer force of the soldiers holding them down with maim and might, while another, the third, submitted, submitted to the whole venture and ordeal. It was at, after this ex execution that had begun that one of the criminals, not nearly so weak as Jesus because he hadn't been nearly through as much, started to mock him and jeer and join along with the crowd. But the other, after a few sentences, stopped himself and actually defeated the, the man being crucified in the center. He recognized that there was something about this man, something that that was unlike him in, in every way. And he begged with Jesus, he pleaded with Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And there, being crucified on that tree, Jesus, with the dignity and majesty of a mighty king, offered out promises of peace and beauty and paradise restored. And he assured this man that soon, very, very soon, all this pain and all of his suffering was going to be gone and that he would be with him that day in paradise. The second word, Luke 23. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is God's word. We join in our hymn response the first three verses of O Sacred Head, Now Wounded.
The third word from John 19. A small group braved the scorn and the ridicule and remained at the foot of Jesus' cross that Good Friday. A small group of women and John, the rest of the disciples, had deserted him. They'd gone into hiding. But John and a few women, including his mother Mary, you almost have to wonder what Mary must have been thinking in that moment to see not just her Savior crucified, but her Son. Perhaps Mary recalled that day when she had brought her son, her infant son, into the temple, and, and Simeon, upon seeing him, said, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. How unbearable. How unbearable to see not just her Savior, but her son tortured and crucified. This son of hers that she'd seen grow into a man, the God who she'd seen, seen to come to know as God Most High. Jesus himself, though, in that moment was unmindful of his own pain, his own affliction. Instead, no, he showed the care and the compassion for his mother and his best friend. Upon seeing them there, he wanted to ensure that both of them would be looked after. And with that, he gives us then the third word. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. This is God's word. We join in our hymn response, What Wondrous Love Is This?
There was nothing the least bit humane about the whole process of crucifixion. It was intended to be quite the opposite. It was probably one of the most painful and barbaric manners of inflicting the death penalty ever devised by the cruelty and cunning of sinful man. The agonies of crucifixion were intended to lay out for a long time, and even the cross was constructed to bring about a slow, painful death. Uh, one historian remarks about the whole process. He says, The feet were not always spiked, but were sometimes tied to the timber with ropes. The feet of Jesus were pierced by a great rough nail. There was at first, of course, a loss of blood and the experience of shock. After the clotting process had stopped the flow of blood, the blood was forced to the head and gangrene set in at the wounds. The victim became first feverish, then cold, and soon experienced a flaming, devouring thirst from which eventually, sometimes days later, he died. Meanwhile, he could barely move because of the pain it occasioned in the wounds. And through it all, his palpitating figure was tormented by flies, by biting and crawling insects. We, we shudder at the mere description of crucifixion, but Jesus experienced an even greater pain. Uh, there came a moment of darkness in Jesus' tortured soul when he felt in that moment an eternity of the hellfires of eternal damnation. It was in that moment that he cried to his God, but no longer as a father, but as a mighty judge. It was in that moment where we see, as Paul reminds us, or as Isaiah reminds us, that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. It was in that moment that he was truly, utterly forsaken by God. Here in the fourth word, we see what the Bible means when it says God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Never forget that the price that Jesus paid, even though it's free, it wasn't cheap. It cost him that eternity in hell that he suffered for you. And we hear that in the fourth word. Matthew 27. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. This is God's word. We join in our hymn response, the hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted.
Jesus had gone more than 15 hours of enormous strain and torture by the time we come to the fifth word. And he must have thirsted long before coming out to Golgotha. On arrival there, he had initially rejected the doped wine that he'd been offered as a sedative. And after hanging there on the cross for six grueling hours, the pain, the punishment, the thirst must have been unbearable. But we never want to forget that Jesus willingly did this suffering for us. This was of his own accord. He could have come down from the cross as those who jeered him, as those who mocked him. He, he could have come down, and yet he willingly wanted to suffer for you and for me. He asked for forgiveness for those who mocked him. And the only expression of physical need to come from his lips is this fifth word. And, and what it reminds us is of is the reality of the punishment that Jesus faced in that moment, that he was, in fact, uh, a human substitute, a real authentic substitute whom we needed to live under the law and to fulfill the law which we couldn't. He felt the flames of hell and suffered because of it and his body reacted to the suffering in this way with the fifth word from John chapter 19. Later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. This is God's word. We join in our hymn response, the hymn, Were You There? Death was now near, much nearer than his friends on the fringes had imagined. Some in the crowd, disturbed by the strange, unearthly darkness, 
had lingered for a little while but eventually went home, many of them shaking their heads. Something in their gut told them that this was no ordinary crucifixion. Others stayed, though, to hear Jesus speak yet again. And what they heard wasn't the gasp of a man's dying breath, wasn't a whimper of defeat that the Pharisees, the teachers of law, would have loved to gloat over, but rather a shout of victory, a cry that, that reached into the courts of heaven and into the, the very depths of hell. A cry that established that paradise lost was now paradise respo- restored. And it was, in fact, the greatest single word ever uttered by human lips. Tetelestai. Tetelestai. With that word, Jesus assured you and he assured me that all of our sins have been paid in full. That his mission had been accomplished and that victory was, was in his grasp. And it's that word that we hear from Jesus in the sixth word. John 19. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is God's word. Our hymn response is the hymn, O Mighty Cross. The choir will be introducing the first verse, and the congregation is invited to join in singing verses 2, 3, and 4. We join in that response together.
It is finished. It was a cry that went down into hell. It was a cry that rose into the very courts of heaven. It was a cry that proclaimed the victory over sin and death and hell. Just one more thing now. He is about to breathe his last and his breath is very labored to this point. And for a moment he looks very still. For a moment people think that he has passed, but not just yet. For a while there is silence and the crowd is watching and even the worst ones among them are his enemies still. The silence is penetrating. It makes them shiver. The only sound is the sputtering of the torches where you can see the blood and the sweat dripping from his brow. But look, he moves. His head is lifting. He seems to be summoning one more bit of strength, one more word to say. It was the hour of evening sacrifice at the temple when his last words rang out. And he was confident. Confident that the work had been completed. Confident that his father would watch over his body in the grave. And confident that even though he would die, death would not be the end. Not for him and not for you. Jesus cries out from the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And with that, he gives up his breath. The Son of God dies. The seventh word from Luke 23. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there. Along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. This is God's word. We join in our hymn response, The Power of the Cross, you can see where the congregation is invited to join in uh, in the last two verses.
We join in the Lord's Prayer. Your angels come to Abram's bosom, bear me home that I may die unfearing, and in its narrow chamber keep. My body safe in peaceful sleep until your reappearing, and then from death awaken me that my own eyes with joy may see. O Son of God, your glorious face, my Savior and my fount of grace. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, my prayer attend. And I will praise you without end. 